going to start off with asking a, a question that I'm going to clarify is rhetorical. That means you don't have to respond. And that's mostly because I know that since we're here on Sunday morning, we all know how we're supposed to answer this question. So you'll just like automatically have a response that pretty much everyone else in here will have. Um, but I, I want you to just think about it. It's a question I want kind of on our minds as we look at our passage for today or passages for today. But it's just a simple question. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Now, since we're here on a Sunday morning, we all know the answer to that question because you can't get it wrong. We're here. Yeah, of course, I trust God. We got it. Right. Yeah. Why are you asking? Come on, crazy guy. We, we know the answer. I actually was prepared in case someone's like, no. Because either that person really loves attention or they're just a very loud voiced, honest person. I'm not really sure which it could be. But, you know, we're, we're there, there's a certain amount of honesty there. But I want us to really think about that question. Do I trust God? Because when things are going well, it's really easy to trust God. Right. Like maybe your life right now, even though 2020 has been a basket full of craziness, overall your life is going relatively well. It's not too bad. It's not too great, but it's not too bad. So, yeah, I could trust God. It's, it's nothing too crazy for me. But when times get hard, when things aren't going the way that we had planned, like at the beginning of 2020, how most churches probably, because they thought they were being so clever, kicked off 2020 saying, this is the year of vision. 2020 vision. Anyone? Nope. Okay. Sounded a lot funnier in my head. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. But a lot of, uh, we, we had like plans and all that. So when I say, do you trust God? We know it's easy to do when things are going well, but it's more difficult to, to do when things are a little bit more difficult in our lives. Do you trust God? This is a, an important question to ask. A couple of years ago, I was uh, doing a uh, devotional for before we took the offering in first service when we used to pass a plate in that service and I started off with uh, 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 with just reading Genesis 1 1 which if you uh, if you have your Bibles right there Genesis 1 1 is the first verse in the whole Bible like I said it should be like page one or two if you got some preface pages or whatnot and uh, fun fact when I was a kid I used to say Genesis 1 1 was my favorite verse because it, everyone else said John 3 16 and Genesis 1-1 was the only other verse I knew, so I figured I'll be unique like that. But Genesis 1-1, so when we talk about trusting God, just look at how this starts off. And once again, I started this off just before we took offering, our tithes and our offerings, and I just said this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's a humbling verse for us to reflect upon, to think about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and in the earth. And I kind of was making the point that a lot of times we want to be kind of selfish with our stuff. It's just what we're bent towards, or at least it is for me. And if we have this perspective of in the beginning, God created everything. You know, there's a lot of different names we use for God. We use Yahweh, Jehovah, which are actually the same word, just translated in different languages. But we have a lot of different names for gods. If you go over to Revelation, which we will in a little while, John starts off his letter with God proclaiming himself to be the Alpha and Omega. You've probably heard that before. God is the Alpha and the Omega, which we know is the, the first and last letter of the their alphabet. Greek alphabet? I should have looked that up before I started talking. Yep, that would have been smart. Anyway, but yeah, I think that would be the Greek alphabet. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Pastor. I appreciate it. Anyway. First and last letter. So, And then immediately after that, so I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, when we think of beginning and end because of how our minds work, we think of linear, right? We think beginning point, end point. So God speaks of himself as the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. We think of like points on a line, that God's here, God's here. He's just throughout all things. But one thing I found kind of interesting looking more into the words that are used there is it's not just speaking of like a point, but it's speaking more of an origin. And I, I tried to find a translation of the Bible that kind of captured this idea better. Um, and there was only one I found that didn't translate it beginning and end. And it was the, uh, the Aramaic Bible in plain language. Anyone have that one, one on yourself? I never heard, I've seen it before, but I never quoted from it before. But they translate it as the source and the fulfillment. When God declares himself as the beginning and end, that's a, a little better picture, a little 
greater look at what God is saying. I am the source of all things. I am the fulfillment of all things. In this life, there's nothing that we will need that God has not been the source of. There's nothing we will hope for that he is not the fulfillment of. So when God declares himself the beginning and end, that's the perspective God is giving us. I am the source of all things. I am the fulfillment of all things. In Genesis, we read about how God is the source. He's the creator. He is the beginning of all things. When we go to Revelation at the end, we'll see his fulfillment, the, the end of all things. And so we have to understand that because when we get to Adam and Eve and when God created us, we see different ways that God is the source. You read through Genesis 1 and you see God creating everything. He is the source of everything that has been created. But then when he creates us, he not only gives us life, we reflect on that a lot. You and I were created in the image of God, something nothing else in creation can lay claim to, right? Which speaks not only to the value of yourself, but obviously the value of all people. It doesn't say that only certain people were made in the image of God. All mankind was created in the image of God. There's a certain amount of humility that comes from realizing that. But not only that, he is the source of not only our life, but if you go down, if you're still there in Genesis 1, skip down to verse 28, because God also is the source of our purpose. Because when God created Adam and Eve, when he created mankind, he gave them a job. He gave them a reason to exist. He didn't create everything and then say, all right, Adam and Eve, just enjoy. Go look at everything. It should be pretty cool to look at. Instead, look at verse 28. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now you look, God gave them purpose. Be fruitful and multiply. There's over 7 billion people on this planet. We got this down pretty good. We got the be fruitful and multiply thing. But then he says to fill the earth and subdue it. Now, when you think of subdue, I, I picture like a wrestling match and one guy trying to subdue the other, right? You, you use all your force to make them immobile, unable to move. That's not the idea behind subdue here. The idea this word is used more in a kingly fashion throughout the Old Testament. It describes kings and their ruling over their kingdoms. That's what God had given Adam and Eve. Their purpose wasn't to make creation do whatever they wanted. It was to rule it like a good king. And, and that's why he says rule in the next verse. You shall rule over it. It's not that we exist on this earth to just make it do whatever we want. We are in charge of it to take care of it. In fact, in Genesis 2, God puts Adam in the garden and he becomes the caretaker of the garden. So he gives purpose and and you look at this and you read through genesis 2 and you see that adam and eve got to walk with god i mean that's amazing god creates everything he creates his garden he even plants the garden it says he planted the garden of eden and he put the guy in there and then he creates eve and and now they're in the garden and he walked among them we can't imagine that there's no, like, I can't describe that to you in a way where it's finally going to click. Like, wow, that is pretty cool. It's just we read that they were with God. They walked with him. Can you imagine just, like, calling God up and be like, hey, want to take a walk in the garden? He could have done that. They did that. They walked did together. They were with God. Just this awesome, amazing place. And it's really easy for us from the distance of our high horse that we get to sit upon to look at this situation and wonder how does Genesis 3 take place? If you look at Genesis 3 in your Bible, it'll probably have a headline, something like the fall or the fall of mankind, the first sin, something along those lines. And you might wonder, how could this possibly happen? They were in a perfect world with walking with God. What in the world could have, how could they have done this? I think as we look at the fall, we'll see a lot more of ourselves than maybe we care to admit. Because most of us, if we were to ask, like, if you were Adam and Eve in the garden, would you have fallen for the same thing? A lot of us would probably, no, I, I wouldn't have done that. How dare they destroy humanity? Shame on them. You look at this and you realize that Satan's tactics have not changed all that much in all the time that Earth has been around. See, when God placed Adam and Eve there, he gave them one instruction. 
A lot of times we, we will say Adam and Eve had everything. Well, there was one thing they did not have, and they knew it. God had told them explicitly, you are not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will surely die. And that was it. They had free roam over everything else. They could eat all the other plants. It's just you could not do this one thing. When Satan comes along, his job is not that he has to get Adam and Eve to hate God. A lot of times we think that's Satan's ultimate goal is, is for him to get someone to hate God. That's not what he has to do. He just has to get us to doubt God enough. And when you look at the fall, that's all he does. Adam and Eve didn't hate God. They just doubted him. Just enough. So when you start off here, you'll notice right away, Satan is working towards planting these seeds of doubt in Eve's mind. And it starts there, if you're in Genesis, look at chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, I'm a picture person, and I have to imagine, if you are surrounded by a whole bunch of fruit trees that God himself had planted, I think I would always have some sort of fruit in my hand. Like, there would be not a moment where I would not have food around me. So I almost picture, like, the serpent coming up to Eve as she has, like, a handful of fruit, and she's eating it. And he's like, hey, did God really say you couldn't eat any of that. He twists God's word. Of course he didn't say that. Satan just kind of threw out this huge thing to trip her up. And so guess what happens? She gets tripped up. Look at verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, Oh, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now right away, She's tripped up. She's messed up. She's not repeating what God had said, and she's missing an emphasis that God had put there. Now, first off, she doesn't say the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She says the tree that's in the middle of the garden, which the only tree that's mentioned as being in the middle of the garden is the tree of the life. The tree of life is mentioned as being in the garden. It doesn't say specifically where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. So she may even have her, her mind mixed up about which tree is which and what she's not supposed to eat. So you bet Satan's going to prey on that. But even more than that, she adds in this thing that God said you cannot touch it. God didn't say that. He just said don't eat the fruit. Now it's possible that Adam told Eve don't even touch it. Don't bother with it. So maybe she's repeating something Adam had told her. I don't know. Adam is here in this moment. In this time we'll see that in a minute but he doesn't speak up and correct her but she just says no he said don't even touch it but then notice she misses God's emphasis God said you will surely die it's emphatic you will surely die if you eat this and she just says well yeah God said if we eat it we'll we'll die he doesn't he doesn't say surely so Satan now has a very easy job he has to do something that he does for each and every one of us basically every time that we sin. He has to get her to no longer focus on the consequences and just focus on the substance. Isn't that how he works in our life? When you sin, isn't that how it works? You don't focus on the consequences. You focus on the substance. So what Satan's about to do is to direct her attention away from the real consequences and just focus on the substance. When we get tempted to be angry, that's exactly what happens. We don't think about the pain and the hurt and the damage it could cause our family, our friends, our work, our community, our church, or anything. We just focus on, oh, it's going to feel so good when I lay into them. I can't wait. I've been writing these riddles of beautiful uh, explosion that I can't wait to just blow over all of them. And, I, you know, we think in those terms of how great it's going to feel to give into that anger. We don't think about the consequences of it. Same thing with our lust. We think about how good it's going to feel and not the consequences and the damage it will rain down upon our family. That's what Satan does. It's amazing how he hasn't had to change his tactics very much for us because he found something that works and he just keeps on 
doing it over and over and over again. So look at verse 4, because that's exactly what he does. You won't die. You won't certainly die. Don't look at that. Don't think about that consequence. The serpent said to the woman, verse 5, For God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here's the amazing thing. Satan is also quite good at mixing. Because we all know the lies that are the easiest to be deceived by are the ones that are mixed with just the right amount of truth. Now, what Satan says here is not explicitly a lie, because immediately after they eat the fruit, guess what? It says their eyes were opened. He was right. And when God cast them out of the garden, he says, we can't allow them to eat the fruit from the tree of life now. So he cast them out of the garden because now they've become like us. So in a way, yeah, they would become like God, knowing good and evil. But he doesn't specify that. He just says, You'll, you want to be like God. So Eve does what so many of us have done over and over and over again. Look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit from the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Now, this may seem a little bit odd, but for the first time in history, there was now going to be something in between God and humanity. They saw that they were naked. They saw that they were exposed to God fully, and they couldn't stand it. They were ashamed. Sin does that to us. It makes us want to sow those fig leaves as if we can hide anything from God. It works just about as well as literal fig leaves. But notice how she fell into this trap. And the Adam was there. Oftentimes when we think of this situation, we picture Eve like alone in the corner of the garden and the serpent comes along and like corners her and she doesn't have anyone around to help her. Adam was there, just says that she gave it to him and he was there. And not only that, but if you're an English major, this will make you really excited. But Hebrew actually has a way to describe a second person plural. So what it means is that, like, right now, if I were to say you, I could be speaking about all of you, or I could be speaking about Richard or Jeff or Hester, you know, one specific person. It's not distinguished in English, uh, but in Hebrew it is. And Chris can tell us how exactly if he wants to. But So in Hebrew, here, when the serpent is speaking, he is speaking in second person plural, meaning he's not just talking to Eve. This whole situation that's unraveling is Eve is being led away by lies and deceit. Adam is just standing there, letting it happen. Doesn't say anything, doesn't correct, doesn't encourage, doesn't come through. He just stands there. And Eve sees the fruit, and she thinks of the substance. She sees that it's good for food. She sees that it's pleasing to the eye. This is going to be something great. Now, what in the world could she have not gotten from any other fruit in the garden that this specific fruit would bring her taste-wise? She doubted God in this moment. Somehow there's an experience awaiting me when I take of this fruit that God doesn't want me to partake of for one reason or another because I'm not thinking about the consequences, only the substance. And not only that, it says that she sees that it's good for gaining Wisdom? Can you imagine what wisdom would you lack if you were walking with God? What question could she not have asked him? What thing was she missing out on as she walked with God? And yet this is how sin works in our lives. It gets us to forget the consequences and focus on the substance. I want something that God says I can't have. I don't care what it costs. And so even though we read this and we read about the first sin and the first temptation that they fell into, really what we're reading about is ourselves and how none of us would have fared any better because we fall into this trap on a daily basis just about. Now you might be saying, I've read the rest of Genesis 3 and I see that 
Adam and Eve don't immediately drop dead here, so maybe God was wrong. But remember how last week we talked about being dead to sin, how I had the divider here, right? You have a new relationship with sin now. It no longer calls the shots in your life. It is no longer your boss. You have a new boss. Grace through faith, through Jesus Christ and his blood, you now live a new life. And and sin is still there, but it does not control you anymore because there's a death that happens between you and sin. That relationship is now different. It's severed. And that's what we read about in the rest of Genesis 3. They didn't physically die yet, but surely they died in that instant. The relationship between God and humanity changed forever. No longer would they walk with him in the garden because they messed it up. They pursued their their own way, and there's consequences to that. And that's why in the rest of Genesis 3, when God lays out what those consequences are. Some people say it's a curse that God places on mankind that he later is unravel. I I, I prefer uh, probably more in the vein of these are the consequences of sin because that's just the way it is. It's not so much a curse as it is, here's what happens when you give in to sin. And there was eternal ramifications for them and and, and ramifications not just for them, for, for all humanity because of this sin. Here's what happens when you sin. And he lays it out for the women. He lays it out for the men. And he lays it out that you've broken the system I created. Now, on that happy note, some of you might be wondering, what does this have to do with Christmas? I thought Christmas was like snow bells. And are snow bells even a thing? I don't know. Jingle bells. I thought it was about snow and jingle bells, two completely separate Yet equally, I don't. Anyway. See, the thing is, a lot of times when we come to Christmas, it's so easy to get refocused on the things that just don't matter. I I used to love watching, like, the Hallmark Christmas movies because it's just, you know, that warm. It's almost like when you watch a Hallmark Christmas movie, like, you are sitting by a fireplace drinking hot cocoa, even when you're not. I never had a fireplace growing up, and yet it felt like that when I would watch these. And now, like, I watch them, and it's like they just miss the point. Oh, Christmas is about generosity. Christmas is about family. Christmas is about stop being so focused on your job and focus on other people. We all have had those moments in our lives where we've had those epitomes, right? Where we, like, we come off the mountaintop, and we're like, oh, I've spent way too much time at work. I've been so self-focused, and we're like, I'm going to change my life. Those don't last, do they? We eventually get back in to the mix of things and just things shift. We go back to Genesis to find out the true meaning of Christmas because we need to understand why did Jesus have to come here in the first place? Wasn't there another way? See, God sent Jesus here to redeem us. Which a lot of times when we think of redemption, we think of God coming here and saving us. We think of it in terms of of this personal saving us, of of taking care and and cleaning us up, getting our sin away from us, and now we're perfect and now we're renewed. And that's a huge part of it, but it's not the end of the story. Because you have to realize that the people who have suffered for the cause of Christ throughout the years did not get by just because they knew their sins were forgiven but because they understood the full redemption of what God was going to do. And it doesn't end in Genesis. In fact, what we do get here is maybe a little snippet, a little picture. A lot of people say that Genesis 3.15 is just a little picture of God's first proclamation that he was going to fix this. He was going to change it. He was going to bring it back to the way he had originally designed it. So if you go to Genesis 3.15, God is cursing this serpent, which in a way he's cursing Satan. He's bringing this down upon him. And in this curse, he says, I will put enmity, which is like eternal hatred, lifelong hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, this phrasing that he uses there to describe what's going to happen, a lot of times people will just say this is a good picture of our lifelong struggle with sin, right? Like we talked about last week, being dead to sin. Sin will still hurt you. Sin will still nip at your heel. It will still strike blows to you, but you will not be overcome by it. In fact, 
at the end of the age, the final blow to sin will take place. You will become victorious. It will not strike your head. It only gets to your heel, which hurts, if we're honest. But here's the thing. There's also a little picture in here of why Jesus came. Because when Jesus came to earth, he came to save us, right? To die on the cross for our sins. And the final tool that Satan had, the greatest blow, here's one thing that we'll miss. And anyway, Chris can back me up on this. The word strike and the word blow in Hebrew are the same word. It's not describing as if we get a harder punch on Satan or Satan gets a less hard punch to our heel or something like that. It's the exact same. It's almost as if it's saying your full force, your, your best shot. The Satan will give his best shot, but it's only going to hit your heel, and, and you will give your best shot, and it will crush his head. It will strike his head. So understand that. Basically, both sides are going to do their best job, but only one is going to be fatal. So what happens when, when Jesus comes here and he dies for us? Satan uses his best blow that he can, and he brings out death. And Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. But then God brings about resurrection. He brings about true power. He brings his best shot. And not only does it completely undo everything Satan had hoped to do, but he uses Satan's tools now against him. He uses death as a tool for redemption for us. How awesome is that? Yeah, he struck Jesus' heel, but God crushed his head. But here's the thing. That has not fully taken place yet i remember earlier this year i uh, was really i think it was this year I, I, it's hard to tell this year's been like three years long but there was a movie that was coming out that i was really excited to see and uh, i had it spoiled for me on facebook someone just in a very creative way just put a spoiler on one of their pictures and i just read it and without realizing it and i knew i shouldn't have been on facebook before going to see the movie but I made the mistake anyway. So I knew something was going to happen in the movie, and it didn't spoil the whole thing, but it spoiled a rather important part. And it was interesting sitting through the movie knowing that was going to happen because now my perspective on it had shifted because now I could pick up on those little hints that it was going to happen. It's kind of like when you see the twist at the end of a movie and you go and you watch through it again so you could see all the things pointing towards the twist that you just missed all along. The Bible is not meant to be like a movie. It, 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 it actually tells us how things are going to end, and for very good reason, because it shifts our perspective on this life. Adam and Eve were with God in the garden, and they doubted him as if God wasn't enough. They didn't believe him. They had struggles with that idea. But when, and so God sets into place things to happen. If you go to the very end of your Bible, it's like the second to last page for mine. If you go to the very end, we actually read what happens at the end of time, right? We talked about God as the source. Now let's talk about him as the fulfillment of all things. When we get to the end, we read this incredible picture. Now, when we talk about Revelation, it's so easy to get caught up in debates about what the symbolism means, about how this is all going to take place, how, you know, is this showing us what our history is going to be? I, you can debate that all day long. We cannot ignore the fact that Revelation was a book of encouragement. It was written, God gave John this revelation to pass on to first century Christians to help remind them that God is greater than anything they're going to face on this earth and all the enemies and all the powers that were working against them would one day be defeated powerfully. In fact, I don't think there's another book in the Bible that fully captures and presents for us the awesome power of God better than the book of Revelation. And just seeing him conquer our enemy, and before we get to Revelation 21, God puts a final nail in Satan's coffin. He conquers him once and for all. He's not coming back. Evil. Everything that is the antithesis to God is taken care of. But it doesn't just end there. Because if you're reading this as a first century Christian who's living in a government system that is working against you, that wants to rain down 
hatred upon you and severe persecution, you need to know that it's worth it. You need to know that at the end of the day, when I give my life for Jesus, it's worth it. So God gives John this revelation of not the end of evil, but the beginning of what was supposed to take place in Genesis 1. And if you're there in Revelation 21, just listen to this vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There wasn't any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the source and the fulfillment to me. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Do you trust God? Do you believe that what he just talked about will one day happen? when all has been brought to fulfillment in him that Satan is now done away with forever and we get to live with him in absolute perfection beyond our imagination, that that will actually happen. I was reading Diedrich Bonhoeffer yesterday because I'm a very uh, in-depth person. Um, And he was saying that our minds just cannot even comprehend this situation. There's no way that I can describe it to you where it's going to unlock and now you grasp the magnitude of what it means that God will be with us in a personal, walking alongside us type of way. Remember how God, when he sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, he said they can't have the tree of life. In the next chapter, it's going to describe how God plants the tree of life on basically the street corners. It's going to be all over and running in between the tree of life on both sides. It's going to be the waters of eternal life. I mean, it's just this awesome picture. Everything will be fulfilled in God. We won't have to hope for anything. We won't have to have faith in everything because everything will reach complete fulfillment. Do you trust God? Because if we have that perspective that one day that will happen, how little does this life mean to us. And I don't mean in the sense you just throw away your life. I mean in the sense that I'm tempted, that we're all tempted every single day to seek out our own pleasures as if they're somehow going to match what God has prepared for us. I mean the the side of us that gets tempted to ignore the call of Jesus to reach the world for him. I mean, we just read that kind of uncomfortable part of what happens to those that don't know Jesus. They're still defined by their sins. You may have read that and you're like, I've lied. I feel like I'm a liar. I've, I've struggled sexually, so I'm a sec- does that mean I'm going to be thrown away? No, because in Jesus, you are perfect. All of that has been taken away from you, but those who are not in Jesus. So tell me what's not worth giving up? What's not worth the sacrifice? What are you unwilling to set aside so that you might reach one more person with this truth of an eternal life with God? See, Satan doesn't have to get you to hate him. He just has to get you to doubt him enough to go through this life 
with this on the back burner somewhere else and you're not even thinking about it. He doesn't want us to remember this picture of what it will be like with God for all eternity because he knows what it does to us who believe it. You ever hear those stories of Christians who are persecuted giving up their lives, giving up their, their, I mean, sometimes even parts of their body that just get chopped off or they get burned or anything like that, and you wonder how could they do it? I think it's because not only they recognize the greatness of being forgiven, but they understand this concept of being redeemed fully. God's redeeming not only you, but this world. Every week we celebrate that with communion. We're going to sing a few songs as we finish up this morning. And when you take of the cup and you take of the cracker, I want you to think of something. Redeemed is not a word that we use very often nowadays, except for with coupons, right? Go on Amazon, it says redeem this coupon, you click it, you get 5% off or something, thanks for the 30 cents or whatever it is. But did you know that when you redeem a coupon, you can read the fine print on there. The manufacturer actually pays the cost. So when you give that coupon to the grocery store to get 50 cents off two cans of food, Campbell's is the one sending 50 cents to that store. They pay the cost. When I talk about us being redeemed, know that you have a cost that's been paid. In a kind of silly way, we're God's cosmic coupon that he's willing to cover. He's going to redeem us. He did so by going to the cross. He did so by by being here in the flesh. And when we think of what Christmas is all about, it, it's not just about generosity. It's about extreme generosity motivated from the understanding of what God has accomplished and will accomplish in our lives. It's about recognizing that as Christians, uh, Christmas is not just arguing about keeping the capital C in Christmas, but understanding we can give all of ourselves because Jesus gave all of himself for me. So that one day when I die, I stand before God perfected, and one day I will walk those streets of gold that he is laying out in this new kingdom that he is redeeming for himself. And when you take that cracker, remember how it was paid for. When you take that juice, remember how you are cleansed. And remember your call. We have a world of people that don't know this truth. It's on us. Empowered by him, strengthened by him, but it's on us to make the most of all we have on this life to share this truth with the world so that they might know this truth. If you're able, let's stand and let's praise God now.